The Friday Sports Riot. I'm going to start a riot. I'm going to start a riot. The Friday Sports Riot on SportstownChicago.com. What's up? This is the Friday Sports Riot on SportstownChicago.com. I'm Ryan Hoppy. And I'm Ryan Stuppridge. And Ryan, who do we have on the phone line? On the Illinois Center for Broadcasting Hotline, we have Scott Jackson from ESPN 980 to talk some nationals. What's up, Scott? Hey, you. How are you guys doing? We are doing good. So now your offense over there in D.C. has been doing very well with two grand slams in the last two games. What has been going on for the Nationals? Well, uh, the Marlins, for one, uh, was helpful, I think. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, other, the other thing is, you know, this, this is a team last year that obviously um, suffocated uh, with, with the hype and uh, wasn't ready for it. And really never got going until it was too late in the season offensively, and and really everything didn't start clicking until the to the really they, they didn't have a chance. They dug such a big hole. Now I want to caution Nats fans, the people observing them. They were seven and two last year at this point. This is really kind of a, a nice weekend of um, measuring stick weekend, if you will. As they, they played the Braves, a team that mm-hmm. just flat out dominated them last year, and already has taken two or three from them this season here at Nats Park. Last you know it was last week, and the Braves came in and took two of the three games here. So. This would be a good uh, barometer kind of uh, weekend for the Nationals as they are in Atlanta and really don't have their best pitchers set up uh, for the series either. Uh, do you think Steven Strasburg could be put um, up at the elite spots in the National League along with guys like Kershaw and Adam Wainwright? Well, he's got that elite kind of stuff. I don't think he's had the elite kind of uh, results yet in terms of the full season. Last year, I think he pitched much better than his record, indi- record indicated. And as you guys know, I mean, a lot of the stuff now we're learning, like, you know, the new the new thinking in baseball is wins are somewhat overrated, and, you know, they look more into uh, some of the other uh, numbers. And, you know, I think uh, he, overall he, he, had some, he, he did some good things last year. I just don't think he got any run support. And now the Nats have some of the best pitching in the MLB. Can this be what puts them over the top to have a great year? Well, I mean, that's what they were designed to do. I mean, the, the, the building of the uh, franchise has been about pitching from day one. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, we haven't even seen Fister yet. You know, supposedly, you know, he's coming along nicely, and they're, they're trying to be real careful with him. So, I mean, that, that's what it has to be. I mean, you don't have um, – you know, they've got a lot of good bats on the line. I don't think they have any, you know, dominant hitters by any means. I mean, Harper could be that guy. He hasn't been there yet. Uh, works really good when he's when he's in the lineup and when he's healthy. You know, so far so good there. But his history has said that he'll he'll miss games at some point. So yeah, I, I think you know they got a lot of guys that get a 25 home runs. They don't have maybe have that 40 home run hitter uh, on this team right now. But yeah, I mean definitely it's going to be pitching if, if they're going to if they're going to get it done. It's going to be because they're starting pitching so good. What is the hype like right now for Bryce Harper two two years into his MLB career? Well, it wasn't very good going into this. The series against the Marlins until he hit that monstrous uh, home run the right, other night. Right. But yeah. Yeah, he got off to a slow start. Yeah, he did a lot of you know uh, working out this off season and changed his body and all that. And you know that's great and everything. But you didn't have to see how the guy play. And you know last year he just was beat up. People just want to see him healthy. You know, have a full healthy season. And um, you know we'll, we'll see if that happens. I mean, there's just an enormous amount of. Uh, hype around him, you know, because of, uh, you know, his story being out there so early in his career when he was in high school and, you know, rushing through high school to get to the pros and those kind of things. So, uh, I mean, he's been really productive, though. He's been on the field. It's just been, again, a matter of him uh, being available. Uh, now, Ryan Zimmerman has been one of my favorite players in the MLB for a really long time, ever since he was up uh, up in Canada with the Montreal Expos. Uh, what makes him such a consistent player? Well, I mean, I think you look at him, and he's, you know, he, he first of all, the, the infield part of it is a little scary now, because here's a guy that, you know, five years ago we were saying, oh, he's like the Brooks Robinson type, <laughs> the kind of thing, mm-hmm. at third base. Now, you know, sometimes a routine play is not so routine with a shoulder issue he's had for a few years going, and it's a little scary, and, you know, that's the thing. His bat, he's always been good, he's been a consistent player, uh, you know, this is nine years with this with this franchise now, and He's, you know, was the, the guy who came from UVA, so he's kind of had a little bit of a local connection uh, coming up, you know, on the Nets. And, you know, even when he got called up his rookie year here in Washington, he was he was really good, even though he played like 20 games at the end of the year. And he batted almost 400 in those 20 games. And then and he's always been a consistent bat. He's like, a, you know, he's going to hit like around 275, 280 for you in that range. He's going to drive in, you know, 
uh, upwards of 80 plus runs, you hope. And, uh, you know, he's, he's got the potential to hit over uh, 25, you know, to 30 home runs. So I mean, he's just very consistent. He's very clutch. Anytime he's gotten up in, the, in, a, in a clutch situation, he seems to get it done. And, you know, the, the feeling though with him is probably we're probably closer. Uh, to him becoming a first baseman than, than we originally thought. People thought that was a two or three year down the road kind of thing. But mm-hmm. I think this year at the early scare, I think you could see him at first a few games this year for LaRoche and then potentially, uh, as soon as next season, he'll be the, the first baseman on this ball club. What would you call a good year for Ryan Zimmerman in 2014? I mean, I think, you know, hitting around 280, I mean, if, again, if, if, again, if people care about batting average anymore, uh, you know, OPS is in the, you know, in the 800s, you know, slugging's around 500 in that, in that range, I would think, you know, or, if, you know, the high 475, 480 around that area. You know, a guy hit, like I said, hit like 25 home runs, maybe drive in 80, 80 to 90 runs, and I think that would, that would, the Nationals would take that, and obviously a healthy year, really, more than anything. I just want to see this guy, be able to be available for 150 or more games. And uh, how do you like the Nationals' first-year manager, Matt Williams? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, it's so early. He's done some things that are really cool in a sense with the aggressive nature of the way they want to run the bases, but it's also perhaps run them out of some situations here early in the season. Uh, they've been a little bit more conservative lately. Um, the, the one thing that I think you know people are still trying to get a feel for is if he's going to settle into a everyday order with the batting order. He's kind of moved things around a little bit. He's had Harper at second, had him at seventh. He's batting sixth today, I believe. So, you know, just kind of get this idea of, uh, you know, for him, what he wants to see the, the batting order be. He's going to be a guy who's going to platoon a little bit more, mm-hmm. uh, get guys some days off and things like that. He's a very confident uh, guy, and I, I, I think, you know, so far so good for him. I think he's, he's pushed the right buttons. But, again, you know, it's, it's very early in the process, and, you know, David Johnson was really good at his job for a long, long time. Hall of Famer kind of manager, so I, I think he's got some, you know, he's still got a high high bar to reach. How far can Matt take this team? What is your take, Scott? Well, I mean, I think if they're not a playoff team, this year people will be disappointed. I mean, I think they should win, you know, if they're not contending for the East or at least get a wild card spot, and people are going to be pretty bummed out. I mean, they were there two years ago. Uh, you know, I guess there's still the question, were they the team they were two years ago that won, you know, 98 games or whatever it ended up being, or the team that dropped down last year, you know, and, and didn't make the playoffs? And I mean, that's what people want to, around here want to know, but I think they definitely have uh, a good solid core of players and in arms, you know, even though they haven't had Fister, as I said at this point, I think they've gone through the rotation pretty well so far. Uh, so they've got, they've got depth there. Bullpen seems pretty strong. Um, and it's just now they got in their bench is strong. Now they're just going to go out and you know win games. How has the Nets front office been able to turn this around? Where they have gone from being one of the worst teams in the MLB to being a good team like they are right now? Well, I mean they did very well in the draft, and then obviously they've been picking low for a long time. They should be. You know, you had that many first overall picks. Yeah, where you can take two guys that are considered once in a generation of players and back-to-back years and Scott and Harper. I mean, there's a good start for number, for number one. But I think, you know, they're good picks, too. I mean, Zimmerman was a really good pick, and that was uh, one of those uh, extra picks they got there, and, and that worked out well for the sort for Alfonso Soriano leaving for no cost when they uh, let him walk via free agency. So that worked out well for them. Uh, you know, just overall, just the draft process. You know, Ian Desmond was, was an expo. He was originally one of those guys, and that, you know, Ryan Zimmerman was one of the first picks the Nationals made. And so just very good draft selection. And, you know, uh, Rizzo gets a lot of credit. But also, you know, there was, there was a little foundation here before he totally took over control. I don't want to give Jim Bowden too much credit. <laughs> but, uh, but I think uh, Rizzo has is, uh, is done a really good job. And the, the guys in the developmental side of things and the farm uh, systems have done an excellent job in player selection and, and, and identifying guys. And they make good trades. I mean, the Zero Gonzalez trade was really a strong trade for them. I think um, bringing Little Roach in here has worked out well for them as well. And, you know, guys like Espinosa and Desmond have come through the organization have been uh, good finds. So, I mean, obviously, the Rendon selection a few years ago is looking real smart right yeah. now, too. And uh, how does it feel um, in D.C. to have some some of uh, – to, to have a team like the Washington Wizards uh, – who are going to go to the playoffs, their first appearance in 2006, along with the Nationals, playing um, really good uh, ball right now. 
Well, I mean, I think with the, with the Wizards, you know, it's a little bit disappointing because they're, they're the seventh seed. I think a lot of people mm-hmm. looked at them uh, during the season and thought, you know, I think Charles Barkley mentioned this a couple times in TNT, he thought they had the third most talent in the East, and yet here they are hanging on to the seventh spot right now and, and hoping that the Bulls, or the, excuse me, the Bobcats falter so they can jump up to that sixth seed. Uh, so that's big time. Actually, you know, yes, they're in. That's great. But I think a lot of people also look at it, I know I do, is, hey, it's fine. It's a step forward, but it's still not as big a step as we'd like to have seen this year. Uh, and the fact that the Eastern Conference is historically awful, guys. I mean, and you're talking about a team that's won, you know, made a lot of their, uh, lot of their hay versus really bad teams. I mean, they're 12 games below 500 against teams with 500 or better. So, it's you know it's you know it's kind of a mixed bag I'd say I mean look I'm excited to have playoffs here don't get me wrong but I just have a feeling you know in about two or three weeks the Wizards are going to be on one of those gone fishing pictures on TNT yeah. after they get beaten five or six by you know Indiana or Miami or whoever they end up playing. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Scott, and we'd uh, love to have you on again sometime to talk about some sports in Washington D.C. Thanks, Scott. All right, Ryan. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. No problem. I was going to ask him about John Wall. Oh, okay. Well, it's all good. Ryan, real quick, what is your take on John Wall? I want to get it. I'm just curious because John as Wall, an outsider, I don't watch enough Wizards. It's not something that I go out and see. Well, like, obviously, hey, it's a we can't night. really see it. You know, it's, it's, not, it's I mean, not like we can watch all their games. You can watch it on like VIP Sports that site, but yeah. it's just like when there's something else on that's productive, why do you want to watch the Wizards? So, real quick, what is your take on John Wall as a player? I think he's a bit of a disappointment coming out of Kentucky. Yeah, well, he is kind of a disappointment. He's got some explosive moves. He's uh, he's been pretty decent for a while. Uh, That's the key word, Ryan. Real yeah. quick, decent. Yeah, he he. You know, he. I'm I'm not sure if he can be somebody you build around. I think he's more of the guy that you bring a third player to the side, where you bring somebody that he can work with, not so much as for him being the main guy, because uh, him being the main guy, you know, doesn't really help that team. But also, I mean. Though the, uh, I, I mean, they, they were good, like in 2006 with Gilbert Arenas and everything, and then Gilbert Arenas brought went a and, gun into a locker room. Yeah, he went and, and then sort of ruined everything, and Butler then they playing, haven't really been good ever since that. And then Butler quit playing basketball once Antoine Jamison reached like past like 29 year part, and you reach your 30s. He quit playing basketball. What happened, Antoine? He used to be one of the best players in the league. He won most improved player, and he went from being 29 years old and great. Once he reached the 30s, he quit playing basketball. Yeah, he did. That whole team just quit playing. The team was, like, good. Karan Butler, um, Gilbert Arenas, Randy Foy was decent. That whole team was all right. And then once Gilbert quit being a team player, I think Gilbert was the one that helped him. Gilbert once scored 60 points in the game. Yeah, and, and, and he always that. made those half-court shots, I remember. He would make, like, all these half-court he shots. He was the king of half-court shots. He was. If you want to call the show and talk about everything that Scott Jackson just talked about, Scott Jackson from I got ES- my national shirt on too. So uh, oh geez, look at you, you yes. Nationals fan. Call the show six three zero four zero three fifty two hundred six three zero four zero three fifty two hundred, and we will be right back on the Friday Sports Riot. The Friday Sports Riot on SportstownChicago.com. 